Let me All see. Right. Let me Am see I how I frame right this. Spot here? Yeah. Am no, good? you're good. Yeah, okay. sure. So, uh, yeah. Let me see if I can frame this a little bit. Um, I've known Kyle for uh, most of my adult life, and I like to think my adult life really started when I left college and became an adult and actually started paying taxes, is what my dad said. You know, my first paycheck when they took half, now you are an adult, you know why the government <laughs> hates you. So uh, the way I met Kyle is we both got invited to play in a celebrity golf tournament, but Kyle and I do not play golf. So in the NFL, they have these celebrity golf tournaments, they invite Plus. NFL players, and uh, you show up, and I don't golf. Um, I like can think of 4,000 other things that I would rather do other than golf. And those of you guys that like to golf, good on you, it's not us. So I, I meet Kyle, and he doesn't golf either. And he's like, hey, let's, uh, let's go out, and we're going to go to dinner, let's get a drink. So I walk downstairs and at the, the place we were staying, and this dude pulls up in this like badass like V12 two-door Mercedes, lowered, <laughs> it's all black, and it's like, Vroom! rolls the window down, he's like, get in. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> So I get in and uh, he fucking just smashes it and we're easily doing 125 miles an hour on to get on the freeway. Like we hit warp speed and he's like, you know, they fucking set the governor on this piece of shit at 178. And I was like. <laughs> and I drive fast and like he's taken off and then he, uh, you know, Kyle was, you know, top 10 pick uh, the year before me and really set the bar for me as an individual, because I came a year after, so uh, as I'm training for the combine and I'm getting ready, all, you know, everybody heard is, you know, you want to be the next Kyle Turley. You know, Kyle ran, went out and ran like a 478 at like 300 pounds, uh, had a crazy vertical. Three. With, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> uh, goes out and crushes it, like does incredible, uh, is a top 10 pick, and goes into New Orleans and starts, and so then I come out a year later, and, uh, you know, I thought, hey, man, if I can just run sub five flat and do all these things and hit it and um, ended up becoming a fourth round pick. So I didn't do as well, uh, but ended up coming in and starting as a rookie. And then I meet Kyle and uh, it was similar to deal where it's like, how come we haven't been friends longer? And we've been friends ever since. And uh, he played in New Orleans. I played in Philly, went to Kansas City. And then Kyle was in St. Louis and I used to go over and see him. And then um, we ended up uh, meeting up in Kansas City and playing together. And we got to play, I got to play guard, he got to play tackle, and we went and kicked ass. And it's probably my most memorable, most fun I've ever had playing football. And the only thing I could liken it to is, um, you guys know I'm the youngest of three kids. I got two older brothers. They both played college football, and they played next to each other, guard and tackle. And uh, they would go out there and fucking scrap on people. And that's the only thing, I, that's the closest I ever got to playing with my brother, was uh, playing with Kyle. So. Um, you know, obviously our careers end, you know, Kyle's out in Tennessee, I'm in, in California, and um, it was a really interesting thing to see the effects of football on players that had done our job. Um, you know, and I saw Kyle go through this deal, and it was uh, pretty, it's fucking scary, man. Yeah. I was scared there for a little <laughs> bit. And all of a sudden, man, uh, Kyle came through it, and it actually was uh, the CBD and the company that he started, uh, NeuroXPF, that I'm more than happy to be a part of, uh, saved my friend and helped him get on his journey. And uh, it was like, it's like your friend got sent away and he came back. And I remember I was so happy, like when I called him and like everything was firing and we were hanging out and I was like, fuck man, it's great that like, I felt like I lost you for a little bit. And what's so scary for a lot of guys that played our job and have done it, like they're still lost. And we're out there trying to pull them back in. And you know, like what's sad is when we get together, we talk about all the friends that have died, all the guys that have committed, killed themselves and committed suicide and done it for this, this game. And as you guys heard, one of my favorite songs is Kyle's Fortune and Pain. That idea of like, you know, you go out for the glory, you set your body on this altar of football, you set it on fire, you go out there and you do it to hear you know, not the crowd, nothing, but because the guy playing next to you is a good motherfucker and you want to go out there and just whoop wholesale ass just to, to do it, right? Jolly Green Giants walk in the earth, kind of crush it. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to sit here and have him here at the table and uh, fuck, man, let's chop it up Thank a Thank you, bit. brother. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thank you for that, man, uh, and that introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, just to follow up on, you know, uh, the, uh, the journey here, uh, you know, from that uh, uh, you know, story and in, in John's eyes and, uh, you know, where I've come from and where I'm at, um, 
you know, I don't think that's too much different than anybody else in this room. I think there's a lot of people that, you know, have to overcome uh, adversity in their life. You know, whether it was when I was at San Diego State um, and the first time I blew out my knee and thinking, oh, I'm never going to make it to the NFL now. How do I start over? You know, when I built this, oh, wow, look at this kid coming out of San Diego State. Boom, blows his knee out in spring football to post football and dealing with life and marriages and kids and just life, you know? And at the end of the day, that's what, um, aside from the, the drastic change um, in uh, allowing me to be able to do that and tap back into who I was, uh, because I didn't think that was possible as it was just continuing to fade. You know, you, when you leave the NFL, you gimp away at best. Nobody walks away from the NFL. Nobody walks away Maybe from... Maybe like one person. Like Tony, like Tony Gonzalez yeah. is the only dude that was like, Maybe. Yeah. 17 years, I'm okay. I'm going to go have a kick-ass announcer job. You can keep yeah. a couple million yeah. bucks. I don't want to play for your teams anymore. Yeah. So like one dude I've known... Maybe. Maybe one dude. So like yeah. they don't... Hey, thanks for coming. You know what they do? They, you walk up to the door and they hand you your shit. When I left the Patriots, I uh, left the doctor, came back, and like there was a dude standing out front. He's like, I got your stuff. I'm like, great, thanks. You get the box. Yeah, right? yeah, they hand you a box. My last day, I ask people that question, your last day on the job. You know, a lot of people, they work occupations. Uh, they don't have the opportunity to see that end. It's something you've worked so hard for to build this uh, you know, opportunity for yourself, to see it end so abruptly. And then what do you do? And uh, people don't believe how this journey ends you know in the, in the nfl you're literally given a box with all your shit in it and here you go the next guy's in your locker uh and you get a message from the general manager a voicemail saying thanks you know uh, have a great life and um it's consistent usually with everybody you very rarely get to walk away from this game uh you know some of those guys are uh, few and far between and um, the reality is even then uh, they're not walking away with everything. And that's what I learned. I learned that this game affects everyone. I learned that head injuries and head trauma affects everyone. No matter if you played football um, or you're just out in everyday life, uh, the world is out to do harm to you. And I had this discussion a little bit earlier um, in, in that, you know, having to, to tap into this mindset every day of realization that this world's trying to kill you every moment you step out the door. How do you empower yourself? How do you empower your, your motivation and your performance every day? Uh, and for me, trying to find the resolutions for that with these guys who you know, had these degrees of higher learning on their walls and uh, you know, they just kept prescribing all these things to me and I got caught up into the you know, pharmaceutical world. Uh, and I, I don't, is anybody here by show of hands? I don't know if anybody has overcome opiate addiction. Anybody? Anybody? All right. Well, I, right. I just remember Kyle was yeah. going to the doctor, and they would like, uh, he'd be like, hey, they prescribed me this and this, and he'd go back to the doctor, and they would prescribe him this and this, but they didn't necessarily say, hey, don't take this anymore. So all of a sudden, you end up with like nine or 12 or 14 different things, and like you're waking up and being yeah. like, man, I don't know. And, it, it, and to me, uh, seeing this happen and like the progression and being like, yo, man, like, this isn't medicine. Like this is just pharmacology at its worst where they're just stacking on. Well, we gotta find the right combination. And I'm like, ah, that feels, you know, but that's, that's the culture uh, in professional sports. Like, hey, you know, like if you're messed up, here's a pill for it. And part of my journey and what you guys see here at Power Athlete is finding ways through not only training or this and that the conventional isn't always the best way. And, um, but you know that was the past, or uh, that was then. But um, what I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because I think your journey is so unique. Like, how did you get? Like, uh, you didn't start playing football until you were a senior in high school. You were a surfer kid from the IE, mm -hmm. uh, lived out in Mobile. Mobile. Uh, I grew up in Palos Verdes, which is you know not like Riverside. It's kind no, of a nicer little area. Not at all. Yeah. White bread uh, town. Yeah. So uh, Kyle uh, was a surfer, uh, grew up in Riverside, uh, skater, and decides to go out and play football. So you played hoops, you did basketball. Like, yeah. what, what was the journey, and then what kind of turned you on to playing football? Well, again, you know, it's about uh, being an athlete. You know, that's why you guys are here, how to become better athletes. And, and empowering your performance is strictly about that, it's maximizing your athletic potential. Um, and luckily, I grew up in an era that forced that on us. Uh, in today's world, everybody's so secular in what they're doing, uh, it keeps them from doing other things. 
uh, from my son who's committed to baseball, but when I put him on a football field, he's lights out, he's amazing, you know, it's all natural. I put him on a wrestling mat, it's amazing. And, and uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to force him to do those things because, you know, it's, it's he just baseball, baseball. Now you have all his travel ball, you all this. Uh, and in uh, performance and training world, um, you don't have many platforms like this. You don't have uh, platforms that are strictly trying to maximize your athletic potential. Uh, they're very much so pigeonholing themselves into a mindset and, um, you know, a corner uh, of, of a group of people that it looks a certain way, acts a certain way. And uh, what you see here and what I've seen here since, you know, um, John has started this thing and I've seen him from the beginning, but in being around now this expansive community, um, this is truly you know, a very unique uh, program and a platform, um, and it speaks to everything that happened to me and, and where my journey has gone from and where it is today. Uh, and what I see out here is what I see in myself and why I speak so much about um, you know, cannabis and all these other things, because that was what helped me tap into getting back to being me. Uh, and for me, it, it's about living life, you know, whether you're going out and surfing, whether you're uh, skateboarding, uh, you know, skydiving, whatever, um, uh, playing music, uh, you know, to lifting weights and, and exercising. Um, that's what it, you have to do to continue to get out and re-energize that, that blood inside of you. Because as we get older, and what happens at the end of an NFL career, and unfortunately we're dealing with this bad brain on top of it all, is that you're just declining constantly. Your body's decreasing in production of all these hormones and things, and everything's just kind of going haywire. Uh, and you really have to figure that out and understand how your body works. You know, When you're young, I mean, when we were playing football, all the receivers, just so you guys know, all these guys that are ripped and cut, and they got all these... They eat McDonald's every day, every yeah. meal of every day. No, you guys have heard me okay. talk like the, the most shredded dude I knew. And they're he the fattest take, guys now in retirement. Yeah, no, look at Icky Woods. And, he would take uh, chicken McNuggets and he would dip them in salt and sugar and then eat them yeah, and drink a Coke and yeah. the dude was like 3% body fat. Because so, you can. Uh, you yeah. can. You could when you were young. And as you get older, you realize yeah. that, that that's, that's not possible. You can't sustain that. And so for me, life became about deciding whether or not you're going to literally get busy living or get busy fucking dying. Ooh, because a little Shawshank Redemption. That's right. That's right. Do I get points for that? Is oh, yeah. No, that's... Uh, uh, we, ring the, we, ring the bell. we have uh, uh, some really epic uh, movie arguments on our podcast. Yeah. And whenever it goes back to the favorite, like, uh, so if Shawshank Redemption comes on, wherever it is, I usually sit and watch it. Like, it's one of those movies, and I always love, like, Andy Dufresne pulls up. I'm like, yes, I got about two hours to watch this movie. But, uh, okay, so I'm going to pull you back, but tell us, so, so how did you get, so uh, I'm so always amazed by this, like, not only, you only played football one year of high school, how did you, like, decide to go out, and then all of a sudden you go, and you get a scholarship to go to San Diego State, like, how did, like, okay. one year? All right, so stick to the script. Um, well, I want to know this, no, I got, and I'm so Believe me, I'm like you, you fucking, you guys know, you understand, you've been dealing with him for however long <laughs> you've been a part of this shit. Um, so again, it's seeing a pathway, something you're interested in, something you're passionate about. If you're sacrificing for anything, you're in the fucking wrong business. You shouldn't be sacrificing your time to do anything. That should be what you want to do or don't fucking be there. And once I played football, the first time, I loved football since I was a little kid. I uh, had unfortunate circumstances that I didn't play football until I was a senior in high school. I wrestled, I played baseball, I skated, I was an athlete. And especially wrestling, um, you know, transition right onto the football field. I, I tell kids and parents to this day to have um, uh, kids in youth football, um, put them in wrestling. Don't put them in football. Make sure they can wrestle first because that's what football is. You have to learn how to balance. You have to learn how to deal with your body and your movement. Athletic, figure out how to work with contact against another human. You know, this is full contact basketball, basically, you know, at the end of the day. And uh, unless you're uh, skilled at doing that, you're going to get thrown around by guys like John and myself. You know, watching Mike Tyson talk about his son wants to be a pro boxer. He's like, <laughs> I was a boxer. You, I, I, you want a faith in animal like me? That's degrading. That's, yeah. that's the, you know, I don't want that. You, you, you go to private school. No, do you, That's what he said he told his son on the Joe Rogan Do you remember what Ty, uh, like, 
Tyson's like, when you were 12, you went to Europe. When yeah. I was 12, I went to jail. Yeah, yeah. It's embarrassing yeah. you want to be a fighter because yeah. you might have to fight people like me. Yeah. You're too nice. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, uh, that, that but, actually struck me. Like, when I heard yeah. Tyson say that, I was like, oh my God, like, that dude wasn't fighting because he liked to fight. He was fighting because all he had was fighting. That mm -hmm. was it. That's right. I mean, that's a caged animal, and that's why that dude fought like that. And for me, it was coming from where I came from. You know, Mo Val is uh, an interesting place, Marino Valley, California. Well, and uh, also Mo Val 20 years ago. Yeah. Or 30 years ago. Still like, today. Well, but, <laughs> but uh, so yeah. Riverside's really interesting in that, like, uh, it was this exodus out of L.A., and there's a really interesting demographic and in where he lives. I mean, that was... Uh, I don't know if you guys knew, there was an exodus of the LA gangs. So when the gang violence got really bad, people, and there was you know, gentrification and they sold homes, all those guys sold their homes or they sold and they moved and they basically moved out to Riverside out, out for cheap homes. So they had this huge, like, um, and the reason I know this is you know, my dad was a defense attorney, my brother's a defense attorney and prosecutors. And so I'm pretty good in terms of like understanding the LA culture in that way. So I knew exactly, I've stopped for gas many times in Mobile yeah. and I remember getting out and being like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to fight my way out of this place. And we grew up in the LA riots. All those things happened around us as yeah. we were growing up. Uh, and you know, my high school was surrounded by na the National Guard uh, one day with machine guns, it was like Red Dawn. Um, you know, literally, it was fucking crazy. Um, and, you know, so I grew up in this town. When I moved there, my uncle's like, that's where I go. Where are you living? Where are you moving to? And uh, he was like, that's where I used to go buy drugs because they lived in Orange County over the hill. Um, so anyway, I came from a blue-collar town, and um, uh, my dad was a truck driver. We had five kids. Uh, you know, nothing. Uh, ended up getting, going through the divorce like most people in here uh, with the parents of that era. Uh, you know, have uh, zero commitment <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, and they, they couldn't stick anything out or figure it out from an era that uh, you know, whatever happened there, I don't know if that's going to be the same with millennials. Um, you know, they always constantly need approvals and attention and all these things. I grew up in an era, we grew up in an era where we didn't have an opportunity to have a fucking excuse, basically, at the end of the day. And if you wanted to do something, you went and did it, and you either did it the way you were supposed to do it, or you're off the team. Um, I had to sign up for spring football. My coaches were in a uniqueness to what this platform is, um, I was speaking to some of the coaches. When I was in high school, we were doing all of this, every bit of this we were doing when I was in high school. And you really don't see that even still to this day. I was blessed with unique coaches and people that were around my life uh, that I paid attention to. I, 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 liked, I thought that you know, more people did, uh, and actually from certain coaches they did, my wrestling team, I mean, we got four Navy SEALs out of that group, guys that still lead the, 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 uh, the, the teams today. They're the top guys, my buddies that we used to go break car windows with and protecting the president, <laughs> uh, busting mailboxes with these guys. They turned out to be amazing people because we had these unique coaches. Um, and we grew up in an area of a blue-collar mindset, and we just didn't have any excuses. Nobody cared. Uh, we didn't grow up in that era, thank God. And uh, it's very difficult to try and instill those things to this day into my own son and as he's growing up and getting older. Um, and it separates him from the pack and the herd. You know, unfortunately, I was able to be around people like that and I listened. Um, when coach said, and there's just something else inside of me that, that made me finish. Um, yeah, you know, uh, you can develop that mindset um, or you're born with it. And uh, you know, fortunately, I was born with a no quit mindset. You know, it, it took everything for me to quit anything. Um, and so when I had the opportunity, I listened to the right people, people that were instructing me. Um, I did what they said. I maximized those opportunities to get to the next level. And that's what it was always about. When I went to San Diego State, I got a scholarship out of one year of high school football. I could have went to anywhere in the country if I'd done all my classwork and schoolwork. Yeah, fuck all uh, that school stuff. Yeah, right? you know, I, I wasn't planning on going to college, honestly. I was going to go work at the airlines and go surf the rest of my life for free. Um, on buddy passes, you know, and getting on free travel, because um, that's all my other friends were. Uh, but I had this athlete side in me, and I had this desire in me to compete and to, you know, really try to maximize what I've been given. You know, each of us has been given this body and, and, and this, this vessel to do something with it. And I think, you know, you see tremendous examples of that here uh, and more than any other, you know, performance um, um, event or anything I've been around, uh, the, the people in this community and, and just in those who I've talked to so far, 
Um, that diversity, again, of, of respecting uh, where you've been, where you're at, and, and where you're going. You know, and I always kept that in mind, and I just never looked back. You know, any adversity I faced, it went back to my high school coach of the three Ds, dedication, determination, desire. Those are what he instilled in me that carried me through. I wrote it on pieces of paper the minute he told me and told me to do it and put it everywhere. I did it. I still tell kids to this day, my son even, I was getting on my wife, I find the, the, I went to my son one day and I had three different sticky notes that I wrote, dedication, determination, desire, you know, try to get him in that. Um, because it's developing a mindset um, and conditioning yourself to go out there and, and he's just leaving them on the floor in the trash. When I was that age, I took them and I wrote them everywhere and I put them on my mirror, in my closet, in my drawers, in my mom's purse, wherever, you know, so that somebody at some point throughout the day was going to remind me of those three Ds. And it was little things like that and then getting to college and seeing the opportunity that I had because I had this unique example of this little guy named Marshall Falk when I got to San Diego State. Anybody knows football, uh, probably the greatest running back uh, of all time, overall. Uh, catch, run, oh, everything, do everything. If you want one back, it is, it is arguably a toss-up, and maybe not even a toss-up between uh, Bo Jackson and Marshall Falk. Because uh, you can throw Barry Sanders in there. Yeah, maybe. He's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he, played, he played and receiver, for Detroit, so that was a... As a receiver, and all, we can argue that. Yeah, okay. yeah we'll argue. <laughs> um, but I had this unique example. Unique thing about Marshall Falk, um, well, so back to when I was in high school, my coach said, you do, you do this, 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 and this, you'll have every school looking at you when they come during the football season. And that's what happened. Okay, I went on five different trips around the country, got flown all over, uh, to visit schools out of playing one year of high school football because they knew where to put me on defense because I didn't know a thing about football playing offense. And they knew I was a wrestler. And they said, get off the guy there in front of you and go get the football. It's like, easy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> keep it simple, why, stupid. That's why defense alignment aren't real smart. Yeah, we call them. We used to make yeah, fun of them. Yeah, geraniums as uh, <laughs> the great, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, as we, we were told. Uh, uh, Who is that, Jim Hannafin? Jimmy Hannafin, yeah, Jimmy yeah. Hannafin, geraniums. They're geraniums. Uh, and uh, so as a defensive lineman, you don't have to think. You just are a heat-seeking missile. You go get the football. If you've got kids in football and they play defense, they only need to know one thing. Make sure your number is on the ball every play, and they will see you. You get an opportunity to move up, and that's what I did. Took advantage of that. Again, then went into college, blessed with am amazing coaches, um, and had an impactful one that came in, uh, you know, Ed White, and yep. Big Ed White, Cal alumni, yeah, um, played for the Vikings and Chargers in that era of uh, uh, Dan Fouts and Fran Tarkington, went to four Super Bowls with the Vikings back in the day. Anyways, this just iconic guy. And so he would bring in guys just like this. And John brings people here to talk to you guys. And you see all these amazing people around that pop their heads in. We had that. And um, at the end of the day, it's up to you whether or not you're going to see that, you know. Are you going to be in line? Are you going to open up your peripheral and you're going to see everything out there so that you can take advantage of, of the, you know, that, that analogy of leaving no stone unturned? And uh, I knew that it, I was coming out of San Diego State. I had to produce. I had to, uh, if I went to any other school, I might have been probably the first pick in the first round. If I would have went to Nebraska, if I would have went to uh, Miami, if I would have went to Florida State, um, or any of those schools, because I was out of San Diego State, and it's still not happened to this day that a sub-major uh, school <laughs> offensive lineman has been drafted in the top ten of the NFL. What and were it you, was number six? Seventh. Number yeah, seven. Seventh pick. And it was because I, I, I had these amazing coaches. I listened to them, and I did everything they said times ten. Um, I didn't want to find myself at the end if I failed saying, because it wasn't about succeeding for me. It was about not failing. And at the end of the day, you only fail if you don't give everything you fucking have, everything you got. Because you can't succeed if you don't. There's no way. That's a sure way to not succeed if you don't give everything you have. And so from recovering from injuries or being from a small school, I never went to any of it thinking I was subpar. I knew that I could be the best and that uh, I would not fail because I've done everything to get there. Show up the senior bowl, kick everybody's ass from all the big schools. Throw them around, you know, don't ju just be an animal. That's what I was told. And show these guys you belong here 
And I did it. Went to the combine, still hold one of the best combine performances as an offensive lineman overall to this day. And, and that's because I listened to guys like that were the John Wellborns of our era, um, which was Mark Verstegen, ended up starting Exos, uh, which was API. And then, but I was with Mark Verstegen in Bradenton, Florida, training for all of this stuff uh, right after my last game uh, in college football. And I lived there and just breathed it. And I mean, we were playing table tennis and with uh, the Williams sisters <laughs> at the Voluntary Academy in Bradenton, Florida. Uh, you know, I got to hang out with them, meet all these tennis stars um, and these amazing people in training that expanded my knowledge. Uh, and again, then run into guys like this and continue to feed off of them. At the end of the day, the reason why anything happens is whether or not you commit. And this is something you're not having to sacrifice anything for. You want to be there. So with the, um, obviously you get drafted, you know, number seven pick overall, you go to New Orleans, you come in and you start as a rookie and you start on this path and, you know, you're fucking tearing it up. And I know because I watched you, we watched it on film. And I remember thinking every time I saw Kyle play, I'm like, fuck, man, that dude is so athletic. Like his ability to move in space. There was one game where I watched him cut a guy like 60 times. He would like flash and spear the dude in his knee and the guy just stopped rushing. And I remember being like, Kyle cut that dude on a run play. Like you don't cut people on run plays. Like Kyle's the only dude I ever saw like flash and cut a guy on a run play and the running back ran past him. And I remember being like, Jesus, this is incredible. And um, it was uh, like, and then we ended up becoming friends and uh, like just the level of dedication and the attention to detail and the kind of like, fuck all of you. I'm gonna go out and whoop somebody's ass. And like that was kind of always my take on everything where I was like, you know what, like I might be giving away size, I might be, uh, you know, dude might be better than me, whatever it is, but nobody's gonna work harder, nobody's gonna outwork me, and nobody's gonna, you know, do this as violently as I am. And Kyle really had that. Uh, and I saw like, you know, I was like, man, this. If I could just be more athletic like this dude, and that you know, kind of take took me on my path. Um, the interesting thing, and I always go back, is so Kyle has uh, a pretty amazing fucking piece of um, NFL lore of uh, ripping off a helmet and throwing it. Did any of you guys have you guys ever have seen Kyle Turley's awful <laughs> fucking throw where he tried to throw a helmet into the stands and it hey, hooked on his hand? Come on, we had all the tape on our gloves. Oh, I got it. I got caught in the tape, you know. So Kyle's a super passionate dude. <laughs> and um, when he gets real mad, his voice gets real squeaky. <laughs> and, he's, and it's like, I, you're really fucking, like I can still hear Kyle, uh, we got into a, like, Sidebar, we got into a fight in training <laughs> camp in the, uh, against, uh, in the Chiefs, we were, what was that, Minnesota? Minnesota. Oh, yeah. yeah, and uh, this guy fucking hit Kyle in the face, and Kyle took a step back, and he's like, steel jaw, motherfucker, and because the guy didn't knock him out. Hey, that dude became a professional boxer. Oh, did he? I okay. took it. But uh, <laughs> he did. He took a hell of a lick, uh, and like didn't throw it back, was like, steel <laughs> jaw, but... Because um, so, they wouldn't let me. Then, uh, you know, yeah. again, that's the demise. You know, the, the game changed. Yeah. You, you have to learn to conform. And unfortunately, but, but after, all eyes are on me going, what's Kyle going to do? Is he going to snap again? Yeah. The liability? This well, idea? that was like, what happened. Fuck, man. You bring so, this shit, rewind five years ago, and you would have told me to go choke that motherfucker to death. So <laughs> Kyle goes out, right? <laughs> so, I would have done so, it. So uh, you were playing against, you were playing against, who was it? It was the Jets, right? Yeah. Yeah, so he's playing the Jets. And uh, dude tackled the quarterback and goes to like twist the dude like salt shaker his head off and try to pop his top and the dude starts screaming and Kyle being an extremely passionate dude just fucking snaps and uh, beat that dude's ass and hucked his helmet and like, I'm not kidding you, like it was all we saw on, uh, um, on the ticker on ESPN and uh, we were like, yes. <laughs> This is the dude. Yeah, I got every, to this day. That was uh, every lineman was like, "That yeah. was uh, I'm gonna. That's who I need to be." Everybody tells me that. <laughs> yeah, and then that guy recently rips that dude's head off and then hits him with the helmet, which and that guy's never gonna fucking play no. again, and he shouldn't. That's fucking bullshit. But like the idea of like uh, you know going out there and like defending your teammates and going out there and putting yourself out there because that uh, even though I think it's fucking awesome and I was stoked for you, that negatively impacted you because you got labeled as a 
as a, a violent individual, which is amazing, seeing is, and I've, I've told the, you guys the story and I've heard it on the podcast, Tom Modrak, who drafted me the Eagles, came over and within like a first few days of training camp kind of kneeled down as we were stretching. And he told me, he goes, never forget that football is a violent game played by violent individuals who get paid a lot of money to do violence on behalf of old rich men. But if you do that violence offside the football field, they'll burn you at the fucking stake. At the end of the day, it's about winning. Yeah. Because the week before, we beat the Rams at a 24-point deficit in St. Louis against the greatest show on turf because Kyle Turley went crazy in the locker room again. And the Saints came out and went on to defeat the Rams. Yeah, Kyle Turley, Kyle Turley. And then I get in this moment where, hey, this is for real. <laughs> And then we didn't win. If we would have won, it yeah. would have been Kyle Turley, you know, motivated the team to go and win, and they won it for, you know, Kyle, and this, that, the other. I'd never been in a scenario where I had an entire stadium chanting my name as I'm being thrown out, you know? <laughs> and, I'm, wa uh, I'm walking out the field to Turley. If Turley. only every morning you could like, wake yeah, up to the oh, entire shit. crowd what cheering happened? your name. <laughs> They will do it when we leave. I'm in the locker room like, oh, as I get close to the locker room, I'm like, fuck, what just happened? Oh, no. Media's going to come in here soon. I'm going to have to answer some questions. No, I'm not. Close, close, close. I knew Willie Roaf. He never showered. Yeah, no, never did. Uh, <laughs> Willie Roaf comes in. I knew he'd be first in. I was standing uh, by the locker room. Willie, hurry up. Will, hurry up, Will. Hurry. Willie because he literally Rofe. just comes in and takes his shit off, uh, puts takes, his clothes and, and, and on, and walks out. And put his suit on. It's the grossest that thing ever. the grossest thing I've ever yes. seen. <laughs> Play a three-hour football game in yeah. like 100 degree heat and come out, take yeah. your pads off, and just put on your suit and walk out. And I always yeah. with no socks and shoes. We're 30 minutes. 30 minutes after it happens, me and Willie Rofer are sitting in the drive-through of like a fucking Popeyes, and he's looking at. He leans over and goes, "What the fuck happened, KT?" <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And I'm just like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know." Uh, it was, and, you know, it was one of those moments you just little, you know, you, it's a fight or flight. We were conditioned that way, you know. They sent me to anger management in my defense, uh, and I go to anger, anger management, management, and the guy's a Saints fan, and he goes, that's what they're paying you for, isn't it? Be I'm a like, violent individual. Yes. That's what you practice for. That's why you're on this team, right? They keep saying that about you. I'm like, yes. He's like, just don't throw the helmet next time. Get out of here. <laughs> and literally, that's what it is. It's being able to have control. Um, to segue right into that, you know, and from where we came from in this beginning of this conversation, I had zero control. I had zero control five years ago to even know how to segue into this to, re to you know, click back into even reminding myself or anybody else that the reason why that happens because I didn't have control, you know. Not well, only were well, those we moments. Done this. We couldn't have done this five years ago. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I couldn't have done it. I know that's for damn sure. You know, I had all these things, not just physically, but uh, neurologically that were going on, and I had no idea. And in these moments uh, that you're faced with to make decisions, I, I wasn't, I didn't have the ability to do that. And I didn't understand that. It was pawned off as, you had a moment of hysterical blindness. Uh, those things are still uh, uh, facing me every day. Those moments where I have the opportunity to have hysterical blindness have faced me ever since uh, I started playing this game, and they got worse and worse from legitimate neurological issues of vertigo constantly uh, to light sensitivity that developed off the charts um, to not being able to, you know, uh, go to a McDonald's with my kids anymore because I would just lose it on everyone. The littlest thing would go wrong, and I'm throwing helmets in a fucking McDonald's playground. Literally, you know, in, in this... Uh, like big helmets or little helmets? Yeah, little like, helmets. Like little plastic yeah, helmets? Chicken nuggets. Yeah, chicken. Uh, I'm visualizing helmets. Ha! <laughs> you know? Um, and, and I had no control. And it wasn't until um, I got to my end of where <laughs> this, this road takes you. Um, and you have to realize and understand it. John's fortunate. You know, John was just next level, and he's having this opportunity uh, to go right into this and build this because he had the ability to keep his mindset focused, um, and that's due to a lot of things that, you know, a lot of us didn't have the opportunity to understand when we were playing. You know, when I got to Kansas City with John, go over to his place, 
He's sleeping in a, a fucking plastic tent pumping oxygen into his bed every night. He's I got see. a literal cage built around. I was like, what's this weird kinky shit, dude? What's going on in here? Uh, is this a fucking kill house? Are you killing uh, Dr. Tom Inkladon, who's yeah. here, is like, hey, John, I got this great idea. I'm going to send you Are a you going to kill me? What, uh, what's happening? No, I swear to God. You're going to uh, chop me up in a million. <laughs> uh, Inky calls me, and he's like, hey, I got this great idea. I'm going to send you a tent in this machine, and I want you to sleep in it. I'm like, what is it? He's like... It's going to uh, uh, reduce the oxygen so you can sleep at, like, Everest Base Camp every night, and it's going to oxygenate your blood. You can increase, you know, uh, red blood cells and help with performance. And I was like, you know me, I'm like, fucking send it. So he sends me this tent, and it shows up, and it's a literal little tent. Like, you zip yourself in, you put your bed in there, and then you get in there, and you got to have fans because it's super hot. And uh, my roommate was like, what are you doing? I'm like, don't ask questions, dude. Just, <laughs> just uh, Inkladon sent this, and I just do whatever Inkladon says. And then you come over, and, like, uh, you know, Inky would do my blood work a couple times a year, and then uh, would look and say, hey, this is where you're deficient, this is what, and design all my supplement packs. And so... Um, that idea of like, you know, maximizing performance and like if I got to sleep in a tent at Mount Everest Base Camp, which I don't know if you guys have ever been to Mount Everest Base Camp, like the air is real thin. So you have to acclimatize to it and then you get there and then I would be like, hey, you should go in there and lay on my bed and I'll zip you in there and like people would come over and I'd lock them in there and they'd be like, you sleep in this? I'm like, yeah, it's awful. And, uh, but like that kind of, and Kyle still makes fun of me for that, but uh, no, I, I, I was always. I don't um, make fun. I, I I wish I would have understood it more. Well, you know? it, um, <laughs> there was a, a thing, and I I realized fairly early on, and this was a, just an interesting observation. Uh, you know, I was a rhetoric major, obviously in college, and was going to go to law school, and I read, you know, read and I wrote, and uh, I was working on like my um, uh, my you know graduate dissertation, and you know I'd have handed in, and I was in grad school. And as I was going through looking at all the notes and reading everything I read, this was like two years and I kind of worked on it and I went back and I reread a bunch of stuff. And I had this like weird epiphany where I was like, man, I don't think I could do what I did a couple years ago. And I started having this like observation of like, man, I wonder if something's happening. And at that point, I started to kind of go down that road. And I remember talking to Dr. Tom and like, you know, I talked to uh, Mauro de Pasquale, and that's where we started doing the cyclical ketogenic diet and realizing that if I can reduce uh, carbohydrate consumption and keep blood sugar low, that I technically can, you know, start helping my brain and ketones and like all of this research. And I realized that through supplementation, through, uh, through diet, through training, and all these other kind of ancillary deals that I could effectively safeguard um, you know, we were talking about, uh, I remember when I met Rob Wolf in 2008 and he was talking about the paleo diet and I was like, well, this is how I've been eating for the last 10 years based off of Mauro stuff and everything that Tom talked about and we would get blood testing and uh, gut testing and figure out like, hey, these are inflammatory markers that eat this and eat this. And I just was very scientific in it because I knew if I put that prep on the front side, I might have a chance to not have the damage on the back side. And then the other one, which you guys have heard me talk about, and this is purely observational. I don't have any data to back this up, so don't come ask me. But it was just an observation of the guys that took the most amount of painkillers seem to be the ones that have had the most amount of problems since then. And uh, I just never really took the painkillers. And I just knew that when I saw guys chewing 7, 8, 9, 10, 14 Vicodins in a single day, like, that was a problem. And, uh, uh, you know, now you see this kind of effect and you're like, man, I wonder if there was the opiates. I wonder if they were doing something or, you know, oh, yeah. and, then, and then we got into the cannab uh, cannabinoid system with the CBD and Kyle sent me all this stuff. And I'm like, man, there's, there's got to be a connection within it. But what I feel like, especially in professional sports, um, if you're going to do the job, if you're going to walk out on the, you know, the, the sands of the arena, um, you know, stand there and say, what is it? Uh, Ave Caesar, Moritori, Teo Salutan, which is the only Latin I remember, which is, you know, Hail Caesar, those of us about to die salute you, is what uh, the gladiators would say before they got killed. Um, if you're going to do that, and you have to make a deal with the devil and say, hey, you know what, like, if I want to do this, and I want to hear 100,000 people chant my name and go out there and beat people's asses and do this and live this life, I have to be willing to put this on the pass and do it but there are things that I can do to minimize the effects and potentially protect myself on the back end. And so I was super proactive in that way. And I remember Kyle being like, man, I should have fucking asked more questions. I should have listened. I'm like, dude, I was trying. 
And the problem is, is not everybody's ready for all the information at the right time when you are. You guys know that. You know, I mean, you guys have heard us say in the power athlete deal, like, you know, I used to watch a whole bunch of kung fu movies, and they always said, you know, when the master's ready, or when the student's ready, the master appears. And I honestly, like, you think about student and master, but not everybody's ready for the information. Like, uh, you know, you guys hear you this, I mean, you might have to be at a certain point in your life for this stuff to be impactful. Like, think about training. Think about all the information that you've heard through Power Athlete and other things. Like, it might have hit you just at the right moment where you're like, brain explosion. Or you think, like, ah, fuck that. Doesn't seem like it makes any sense. I'm not ready. So for me, um, I met really amazing people and had some really great conversations. And like, there was a, a lot of just self-discovery on my point, uh, on, on my part. And um, also, I've, I've kept this, and I've, dude, I, I tell you this all the time, is uh, I still keep this weird feeling in the back of my mind that I'm going to continue to train like somebody might call me. And, <laughs> uh, like, call you and be like, dude, I'll be like, I'll give you two, two good series. I'm going to give you two hard ones. But yeah. like, uh, in that mentality, because that's how I lived my entire life, I, I weighed every meal. Uh, I monitored everything I ate. I took my supplementation religiously. I trained. I got up. There's a reason that we train every morning at 6 a.m. at Power Athlete. There's a reason that we do all this stuff because, um, one, it's how I live my whole life. And for me to change would fucking derail me. The wheels would fall off. But the other thing, when you leave the NFL, um, you all of a sudden lose your support system. These are your friends. You show up every single day and you work with these guys 8, 10 hours a day. They're your friends. They're all you know. And all of a sudden, one day they slam the door and you don't get to go play with your friends anymore. And so what you have to do is you either climb into a bottle or fucking go do a bunch of crazy stuff, or you look and say, fuck those guys, I'm gonna build my own community. I'm gonna build my own friends. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna meet people and I'm gonna put out training and I'm gonna create something that allows me to have the same support system and infrastructure and impact and all of these things that allow me to do it. And it was, it was very similar to me. So when I got approached about doing um, the gig that I, you know, CrossFit and that, uh, it just, it felt like, man, I can go build my own community and I can connect with people and this and people want to train. I can surround myself with like-minded people that like want to break barbells and smash faces and have fun. And, um, you know, have a sense of humor, like all the sense of humor. Like, I think we're a pretty spot on and switched on string condition company, but I also think we're real funny. Like, I think we have a good sense of humor and a good tongue in cheek and don't take things too serious and can throw jabs and everything's kind of like interesting. And I hear this all the time. It's like, man, you guys kind of made it fun and a little bit like, like part of something. And I'm like, yeah, like, that's what I did my entire life. And why wouldn't I want to continue that? It's what I do with my family. It's what I do with my friends. Like, like uh, the fact that I don't get to show up and talk shit to Kyle every day in the weight room and sit there and we had lockers next to each other. And like you live with these people. You go to training camp for six weeks and you live in shitty dorm rooms with these guys and Kyle goes out and rents music instruments and fucking plays in a garage band downstairs and you play the fucking cymbal, you know? That's what you like, do. Like that to me is uh, what it's about. I mean, um, uh, Rob Wolf is, uh, I, I count as one of my best friends in the world and he's gonna be uh, coming up tomorrow. But he always talks about this idea of tribes, that we are evolutionary tribal individuals. We grew up in these small group tribes, not big tribes. We're not meant to live in 10 million you know, people cities. We're meant to be in small tribes the size of this, where people know each other and there's accountability. And I didn't see you, and I didn't see you, and I know you, and I know your wife, and I know your kids. And uh, that's how an NFL team is. That's called a cult, John. <laughs> Is it a good cult? Is it a fitness cult? I'm hey, okay. As long as but, your last name's not Jones. But that idea, like, and, and that's why, like, certain teams, and people always ask me all the time, like, why are certain teams successful in the NFL and others aren't? It's because uh, if you bring in a bunch of guys who work together for a number of years, come up, you know, maybe weren't first round draft picks, everybody kind of drives a crappy car when they get there, and then they kind of grow together and they're successful, and this group is cohesive, those are the fucking teams that win. The teams like the Redskins or all this, where they just try to like fucking bring in a bunch of high-priced free agents that don't give a fuck, those teams never win. They're not successful. Culture starts at the ground level and grows over time. There's no way to uh, buy like, hey, is there like a package to get culture in 24 hours? No, culture takes decades. It takes years to build something and to feel efficient and good and to understand it and all of a sudden have all this stuff come. And um, it... Uh, but that was the problem. Yeah. Culture, right? I mean, we got, you had got in, unique individuals like John, uh, but the culture was developing this quick fix 
yeah. mentality. Um, I, I did my best to hang out with this guy. I did my best to keep up with this guy, try to take things from him. But I had these people that ultimately, one of them that was handing it out, d dies in a hotel room from an opiate overdose. Our head trainer for the Kansas City Chiefs just two years ago, you know, OD'd in a hotel room uh, on opiates. Uh, these things in the era that we were in, unfortunately, were pushed in and made a culture. Um, and that, that I feel robbed of, you know, if I would have had the opportunity, you know, because you look at a guy like John and you're like, ah, all right, man, all right, all right, all right. You know, and unfortunately, you look at these doctors who are going, listen, this Tordal shot is totally harmless, okay? You can take this every game and uh, run through a brick wall and not feel nothing, oh, no I, harm. I, you know? I still wish yeah. I could wake up every morning and get a Tordal shot to yeah. live my life. Oh, you, um, you, you need like, a Vic uh, 14 Vicodin yeah. is going to make, you, that's when you got a problem. Uh, no, one a day is the problem. Uh, Tordal? Yeah. Um, I, I remember I bruised my hands real bad punching. Uh, we were playing like late in December and uh, it was ice cold and I remember punching this guy and I bruised my hands and I couldn't make uh, fists. And I remember like for like a week, I was kind of like punching people and like not hitting them and this. And they were like, what's wrong? I'm like, I bruised my hands. Like I can't make fists. And the doctor's like, I got you. So they gave me a Tordal shot. And about 10 minutes later, I was like, oh, somebody's going to get an ass beaten today. <laughs> and I remember I casted up my hand and I was hitting this dude like Leon Searcy as hard as I could in the face. And I couldn't feel my fist, but I could feel his face against my fist. And I was like, this is, is this legal? Like, are you sure you want to give NFL players this? Because, like, we're going to go out there and fucking murder people. And, uh, they, and, I was, and then they were like, well, you can get one every game. And then I remember guys getting one every day for practice. And I remember being like, I don't know if I want to know I'm dumb myself every day. I mean, maybe on the end of the season, whatever. But shit, man, I saw dudes getting tortle shots in the preseason. And I, we'd always be like, dudes, push that off as long as possible. Don't go to the tort all that. I mean, and it's... It does exactly what it is, it's injectable anti-inflammatory. There's a but, line, a line yeah. out the door. And, but the problem would, is, it, is... It still it, exists today in NFL locker rooms. Yeah. There is still the Tordal line. So you go in the shower, and this is a weird thing, but they would always shoot you in the butt, and then they put a little Band-Aid, and you'd be in the shower, and every dude would have a Band-Aid on their butt, and you'd be like, oh, all you fucking I guys are Tordal? I never it. <laughs> Yeah. You never know. You shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you probably still have a Band-Aid on right now. Yeah, only, but, only Tony's. But that... <laughs> that, <laughs> that, uh, but that, that, that was, culture was... That was the it culture. Was culture. It was culture. It, it was that culture. And unfortunately, that, that resulted in a number of our friends dying, yeah. their lives being controlled by these opiates. My life was controlled by these opiates in single dosage. You know, for me, it was about as my, my path was listening to these people who knew what they were talking about, I unfortunately listened to these doctors and they got me addicted at base levels to where I had 12 pills a day that I was relying upon. You know, from a muscle relaxer to a sleep aid, what was it? Uh, Flexerol is a muscle relaxer. We call them home plates because they're shaped like home plates. Um, we called Vicodin's footballs because they're shaped like footballs. Uh, and then we had um, and the little blue pills. Little blue pills. Uh, were, the Viagra. The Viagra. Yeah. yeah that, that was, what was that? That was uh, a bombs. <laughs> um, uh, what was the anti-inflammatory? Uh, uh, Naproxen, and then there was Vioxx. Vioxx. Yeah. Vioxx. They took it off the market in like uh, two years was, of being out there. It was, uh, causing, it was killing people. <laughs> yeah, it was causing swelling and like I think like the sac around the heart and people were dying yeah, from. Yeah, dying it. left and right. I had bottles of this stuff. Okay. I, I, and even when they outlawed it, dudes were trying to sell it black market. They're like, man, I got some Vioxx. So I was like, oh my we, god. We just uh, lost a mutual friend, a uh, good friend of ours, Jeff Chase. Uh, amazing story. Came out of uh, rest in yeah, peace. And uh, came out of. Um, uh, unbelievable, you know, rough background situation. Ended up going to prison after, you know, like in high school, for you know, selling heavy drugs. Um, his mother was a drug addict, etc. Did hard, heavy time, but he was this massive bear of a man. And uh, Huge. yeah, got out, came and played at a Texas college over here. I can't remember what it was. As a, a not one of the bigger schools, one of these Texas schools. Ended up playing for the Desperados Arena team for ten years. Was with me with the Saints. Um, and he, he just died uh, of what, you know, opiates and, you know, got into heroin, you know, because uh, it, it was, you know, continuing to keep him, dragging him down that road. And that's where that road ends up, um, you know, to all the other friends that are now having organ failure. 
you know, Marcellus Wiley, Jeremy Newberry, yep. uh, you know, it transcends race, it transcends everything. In this long-term use of these synthetic uh, chemicals, your body is systematically destroying, it, it being destroyed. Uh, it's being attacked at every moment you put a synthetic material in your body. Um, even, you know, natural things, if you don't understand what they do, from things like garlic that, oh, wow, this is great for me, except if I eat it in too much, this is like liquid Drano I'm putting through my intestines and uh, is going to eat away at my arteries over time here to where now I'm going to have more problems uh, because that's what that chemically does over long-term use. We were in a culture of, of do whatever it takes to be on the field. Unfortunately, I didn't think there was anything out there out there in natural world. Outside of things like John was into but with the oxygen more, and all that stuff and the diet, which but, we didn't really have back then. But, but he was on the cusp this. of so much. But, but think about this. I mean, um, there's a, a whole recklessness. Like, uh, you can't go out and do that job worried about what you think might happen to you. You just won't. Yeah. Like, like, you'll go out and tiptoe around. So, like, you have to go out there, like, with, uh, with no doubt in your mind that you're going to go out there and come out unscathed. It's like, I always think, like, uh, like no, hopefully nobody goes into war thinking, like, oh, I'm going to go die. Like, no, you go out there to go out and do it. And there's a certain recklessness, uh, a personality type that is allowed to go out and be like, okay, hey, I'm gonna go out and basically smash my head into a dude for three hours in front of you know, a whole bunch of people and see if I can give, you know, get him to quit before I do, just purely off of brain trauma. Like that, uh, there's probably something within the wiring, and we think about this, but there's a definite type of personality, and uh, the reason that you know, we've always been pretty, or our power athlete has always been kind of been embraced within like, you know, the soft circles in military is because those guys are kind of similar. You know, we, we go work with all the, uh, all the teams guys, and uh, man, they have that same recklessness and that same approach. And I was like, oh, I know you guys. You guys are like me and my friends. Like, let's go out and like, you know, smash things and go out and cause trouble and be Jolly Green Giants walking there to stomp on things. And, um, but I, I sometimes think that, you know, that is the mentality of youth. You know, uh, I'm invincible, I can run through, I'm bulletproof. And you get a little older, and all of a sudden you have kids and a wife, and you're doing this deal. And you realize, like, man, like, uh, I'm not recovering like I used to. And so for me, um, what, you know, like I was, at, like when I left the NFL, it wasn't because I wanted to. I, my knee was messed up, and I had had injuries, and uh, I had to have surgery, and it wasn't coming back. And I remember I reached out to Dr. Inkledon, and I was like, Tom, something's wrong. Like, my body's broken. Like, I don't know what is going on. My knee's not working. I don't feel like me. And he was like, hmm. And that's when we met Craig Bueller. And we flew out to you know, Dr. Bueller at Amit, and I remember I hobbled in there and Dr. Bueller gave me this look like, like, I don't know if this dude's gonna be okay. And I left three days later and I knew, leaving there three days later, that if I had met Craig a few years, I'd still be playing the NFL and I could have gone back and played at that moment. Now, all of this is because one, uh, I think I'm extremely lucky. Like I've always said, man, I, I, I'm not the smartest dude. I just have the coolest fucking Rolodex of friends. Like I had people like Kyle and this and this and what I wanted to do with Power Athlete is I wanted to open up the world's most interesting, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Women and the, the coolest cats in the world to people because it's kind of selfish for me to be like, no, nah, I just got, I collect all these amazing people and I don't share. And um, you know, like Dr. Bueller mm -hmm. and, Fre and uh, Tom Inkledon and Christy and all these individuals are all so cutting edge and next level that um, you know, people used to, when I first came out, I used to get hired as a consultant just so that people would be like, hey, how do I fix this? I got a friend that can do this and this. Now I just push them out and we do a podcast. And um, the thing which is amazing about this is um, when I got out of the NFL, man, uh, and, I and I ran into Kyle and Kyle was in this dark place. And I remember seeing Junior Seau die. And I don't know if you guys knew a lot about Junior. Um, I went to the Pro Bowl and Junior drank me under the table till about two or three in the morning and I got up uh, on the balcony to throw up at four and I looked out and Junior was running on the beach. We drank, little, I mean, we drank every drink in the bar and I was sick for like two days and I was throwing up out on the patio and I look out and that dude was running on the beach. He didn't sleep. That dude, and I, I just thought he was an Iron Man, I thought he was the toughest dude on the planet. No, he had severe psychological issues and ended up killing himself and uh, because, I mean, he couldn't sleep. He drank every drink and couldn't go to sleep, and that was insomnia and these problems. And all of a sudden, man, I see that happen, and I see what's happening to Kyle, and I just remember, like, like you know, talking to whoever would listen, uh, you know, 
in the quiet being like, man, like, there's got to be a way to pull him back. And I remember when Kyle got through this journey and all of a sudden moved out to California and got more into the CBD and started his company, all of a sudden we were like hanging out and I was like, I think I said to his wife, I was like, oh my God, I was so scared that uh, I was going to lose my friend and he's back. And now we can sit at a talk to me Johnny table and we can chop it up and fucking laugh about this stuff because we couldn't do this before. And uh, I'm just, fuck man, I'm so thankful you're here and I'm so glad we got to share I this appreciate time. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah.